All right, remember when it was said that corporations are people? Uh, yeah, no. You know who are people? People are people. Workers are people. People who need jobs to pay rent, to buy food, and to get diapers. And tonight, three years after COVID sent our economy into a nosedive, the great news is that people are able to find jobs to do all those things again. Here's today's blockbuster jobs report for January. 517,000 net new jobs were created. I've been in this business for a long time. I cover the economy. That's a lot of jobs. That's nearly triple the number of jobs that economists predicted, and it far outpaces the average monthly job growth throughout all of 2022. On top of that, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, part of the Department of Labor, released data today that showed the job growth for nearly every month in the past year was stronger than originally estimated, meaning hundreds of thousands more jobs were created in 2022 than we originally thought. The unemployment rate fell to 3.4 percent. That's a near historic low. The last time unemployment was this le uh, low, go all the way to the left of your screen, May of 1969. President Biden had this to say following the release of the jobs numbers this morning. We created 12 million, 12 million jobs since I took office. That means we have created more jobs in two years than any presidential term. Here's where we stand. The strongest job growth in history, the lowest unemployment rate in 54 years, manufacturing rebounding at a faster rate than in the last 40 years, inflation coming down. Put simply, I would argue the Biden economic plan is working. In addition to the unemployment rate being at the lowest rate since Richard Nixon was president, some of the communities that were economically battered the most by the COVID-19 pandemic are now among the biggest beneficiaries of this record job creation. A poll conducted by NPR in the Harvard School of Public Health more than a year into the pandemic found that black and Latino households bore the pandemic's greatest economic toll in terms of their ability to pay their mortgage or rent, afford medical care, afford food and pay off their debt. This we knew even while it was happening. Roughly 18 months after that poll was conducted, the jobs report now suggests that the unemployment rate for black workers has matched its record lows and the unemployment rate for Hispanic, Hispanic workers has matched pre-pandemic levels. Now, for the economy to be powering ahead at this pace, particularly in the face of eight straight interest rate hikes from the Federal Reserve that are meant, they're by design, they're meant to cool inflation down. They're meant to cool the economy down. This is a true feat. And the people benefiting from the current state of the economy the most are the same people who were disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. They are the people who bear the brunt of every economic downturn in this country. They are too often people who are left behind in the economic recovery. Now, it's not all pink cloud to pink cloud. Prices are still high. As the eco economist Betsy Stevenson put it, inflation is bad. We all bristle when we see prices higher than we expect. And for some people, that means giving up important purchases. But inflation hurts all of us a little. Unemployment wallops a small group of people, destroying lives and communities. The goal of President Biden, as well as every lawmaker in both parties, and frankly, every rational person should be, keep this labor market humming. Keep GDP growing. No one in their right mind would want to derail this sort of tenuous success and hurt America's businesses, its workers, and its families. Well, almost no one. Kevin McCarthy and the roughly 20 or so strong chaos caucus, caucus members who put him in power, along with a bunch of other House Republicans, who are tonight threatening the entire precious state of our economy with their recklessness as it relates to the debt ceiling. For the past two weeks, the Treasury Department's been using what it calls extraordinary measures to ensure that the United States has enough money to pay off its existing financial obligations, which include payments to Treasury bondholders, military salaries, social safety net benefits, retiree payments. Economists warn that the consequences of the United States not paying its bills would not only be economically devastating domestically, but it could plunge the entire globe into a financial crisis, considering trillions of dollars worth of foreign debt is held by foreign investors. That's why Congress has always raised the debt ceiling when it's needed, including 49 times under Republican presidents, 29 times under Democratic presidents. 
But Kevin McCarthy has vowed he's not raising the debt ceiling unless he gets unspecified spending cuts to which programs, hurting whom, he won't say, in exchange. Today, at remarks at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, President Biden accused Republicans of attempting to destroy the country's economic growth. Look, you may remember when, during the off-year election, I started talking about MAGA Republicans and democracy. And a lot of you thought, what the hell is he talking about? Why isn't he talking about A, B, C, or D specific issue? Well, guess what? They intend to destroy the pro This is not your father's Republican Party. No, really, think about it. These aren't conservatives. These aren't conservatives. These are disruptive people. They intend to destroy the progress we made. Now, Republicans claim to have a plan for forcing the nation into default. Here's what default could look like, according to the Brookings Institute. Social Security beneficiaries seeing delays in their payments could face trouble with expenses such as rent and utilities. Federal, state, and local agencies might see delays in payments that interrupt their work. Federal contractors and employees would face uncertainty about how long their payments would be delayed. Those and other disruptions would have enormous economic and health consequences over time. Given that those disruptions would likely occur when the economy is growing slowly and perhaps contracting, the risk that the crisis would quickly trigger a deep recession is heightened. Hostage taking with the feeling could send us into a recession just as the United States is experiencing record job creation and wage growth. Unemployment sits at near historic lows. The inflation problem is receding. So I ask you again, who in their right mind would want to take the economy that we've got right now and hurt the people living and working in it? The Republican Party's culture wars are taking a potentially deadly turn. In Tennessee, a crusade against transgender people has now led the state's Republican governor to refuse $8 million in federal funding for HIV prevention. Four sources in the state health department tell NBC News that the decision to reject the funding, quote, was motivated at least in part by right-wing provocateurs stoking anti-LGBTQ sentiment. Here's how the story goes. Far-right commentators went on rants attacking Vanderbilt University Medical Center over its care of transgender minors in September. By October, the right-wing media turned its attacks on a task force at the Tennessee Health Department that focuses on trans health and HIV prevention. And Tennessee Republican Governor Bill Lee was listening. By November, staffers were told the governor wanted to cut federal HIV funding for the task force and Planned Parenthood in Tennessee by the end of the year. And in January, in an unprecedented escalation, NBC News reports that the governor decided he would, quote, pull the plug, not just on federal HIV prevention funds for Planned Parenthood and the task force, which totaled $235,000, but on all $8.3 million from a pair of CDC grants for HIV prevention, treatment, and monitoring in the state. The Lee administration has pledged a shift in funding priorities that would effectively steer HIV prevention efforts away from groups at substantial risk of contracting the virus, end quote. Now, we often talk, we sometimes talk about the ridiculousness of the culture wars that are being promoted by far-right extremists and conservative commentators. But when they get championed by Republican lawmakers and turned into policy decisions, they can endanger people's lives. Governor Bill Lee's decision will affect testing, early, detention, or early detection, prevention, education, counseling services, and life-saving medication for those who need it. A report by Marketplace focuses on a Tennessee grandmother who went to the emergency room for a broken toe and discovered she had HIV. A grandmother. That's who's being hurt by this conservative hawker circus. Grandmothers getting potentially life-saving diagnoses. And again, this is free money to the state. It cost the state of Tennessee nothing. The article also points out, quote, Memphis is among the top 50 communities nationally for HIV transmission rates. One Tennessee Democrat was so incensed that he demanded that the issue be addressed during a meet and greet at the Tennessee State House Health Committee. Listen to how his Republican colleague responded. So I'm curious why the first decision as Commissioner of Health was to directly endanger the lives of our Tennesseans. Let's, I told him we'd keep this to a meet and greet. Uh, if you can keep your comments to that, please, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Exactly how much money are we turning away in HIV funding from the CDC? 
Mr. Gross just, about just, that? Just stay, stay to meet and greet. Don't be holding anyone to account now. It's a meet and greet. Joining us now is that Tennessee Democratic State Representative you just saw, uh, John Ray Clemens. He serves on the Health Committee. He's the chairman of the Tennessee House Democratic Caucus. Also with us is Mia Cotton, Chief Programs Officer at Friends for Life in Memphis. Their mission is to prevent the spread of HIV and to help those affected by HIV and AIDS. Thanks to both of you for being here for this important conversation. Representative uh, uh, John Ray Clemens, I, let me ask you to start with. The questions you were asking are important because it is important for Tennessee taxpayers to understand this is not state money, this is federal money that the state actually said we're not taking. And they said we have slightly different priorities, but now it's going to come out of state funds. This just does not seem like a decision that's in the interest of most, the majority, the overwhelming majority of Tennesseans. Who, who benefits from this? HIV was a, was, a, was a serious epidemic that is not today. Who benefits from, from t removing funding from this sort of work? Well, I can tell you, you know, yesterday was Groundhog's Day, and here we are another day in another culture war. And in this instance, it's just an example of the GOP playing political games with people's lives. No one benefits from this. You know, in the state of Tennessee, we've turned away billions of dollars. We still haven't expanded Medicaid in Tennessee, which is, which is also federal money that should be flowing into the state to improve people's health care. And now... You know, this decision benefits absolutely no one. And I'll, I will tell you, as someone who has watched a loved one suffer and ultimately die from this horrible virus, I find this decision heartless and I find it offensive. And, and you know, this is just a political game that is risking people's lives. Mia Cotton, let me ask you about the, the, the where culture wars. Some people don't even like using the word, but where, where this becomes a thing that started on, on sort of in right wing spaces and now becomes policy that will affect people's lives. This is a report uh, by NBC News. A Daily Wire article published on October 20th took a victory lap saying that the Lee administration and the state health department denounced the task force in response to a Daily Wire inquiry and that information about the task force on the department's website was only removed after the Daily Wire asked about it. Around the same time, two health department supervisors told staffers in private conversations that critical media coverage provoked the Lee administration to scrutinize the source of the task force's uh, $10,000 in annual funding, a $6.2 million CDC HIV prevention and surveillance grant to health employees, uh, two department employees said. I mean, this is crazy. Right. This, this, these things that we know happen, talking about transgender kids and and, and LGBTQ uh, people on on right wing sites has now become the policy of your state. Yes, it has. And ultimately, the people who need the services are the ones who are going to suffer um, with the loss of this funding for my agency. We will lose roughly close to about one point seven million collectively, directly and indirectly as a loss of these funds. And that supports testing, access to PrEP and PEP services, access to care. This is going to affect the marginalized populations of Shelby County, Memphis, where we're hit the hardest, and across the state. As well as CBOs who are doing the work are going to close their doors May 31st if this does indeed happen. And let me just ask you, uh, Mia, because in 2023, many people have the luxury of saying, is HIV uh, still a thing? Memphis is the third in the nation for new HIV infections, the first in the nation for AIDS cases. A uh, loss of these funds will maim Shelby County's efforts to, to curtail the spread of HIV. And just to repeat, this is HIV and hep C testing, counseling, education, condom access, outreach to medical care, pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis. Like, this is all basic stuff. It's all basic stuff. It is basic things that people need for preventative services. Um, with us not expanding Medicaid, people have less access to care. The work that the CBOs do across the state is how these folks ac access these services. You talked about the grandma in the ER who was there about her finger. Uh, she actually ended up getting tested by one of these programs. If she had not been there and one of our, and National Cares had not been there, she wouldn't have known about this diagnosis. And then that leads to more people contracting the disease. We've got to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS, and this just puts a stomp on us, and we're unable to do our work. Representative, our doors will close. Representative, what, what are your options? What can happen now? 
Well, and colleagues and I have introduced legislation to try to reverse this and mandate the acceptance of these funds. You know, I, she raised a good point. You know, you said we're going to lose $8.3 million in direct funding, but that doesn't even include the 340B savings dollars that all of these organizations who provide this vital treatment will lose access to. I mean, we're talking millions of more dollars that is going to directly result in the endangerment of Tennesseans' lives. And, and, and what power do you have to change this? You're introducing uh, something to do this, but what, what has to happen for it to exceed? Will you, will you have to get your colleagues across the aisle to recognize that this is, not, this is bad policy? This is going to end up costing your state in lives and in actual dollars. Well, it's fiscally irresponsible, you know, but that doesn't always sell with my colleagues across the aisle who, you know, where hypocrisy runs rampant through the Republican ranks. But I'm going to have to appeal to their to their you know, personal interest and, and, and try to pull on their heartstrings. I serve in a super minority. I, you know, our entire state is plagued by one party rule with a Republican governor and Republican Senate and a Republican House of Representatives, and I'm in the super minority. So I have no choice but to try to work across the aisle and get this legislation passed for the benefit of Tennessee families. But it, it will be an uphill battle because this is a culture war, war that they're waging and, and it must stop. You know, at some point, we have to place people's lives and make them a higher priority than, than these political games that they continue to play to try to score these points. Mia, yeah, it's 2023. I'm kind of amazed by the fact that we've stigmatized HIV again. Um, what, what do you want my viewers to know about your clients? They're people. They're people just like us. They just have a chronic disease. And with access to these services, it's a chronic disease. You can take your medication, you're fine. If you're undetectable, you're untransmittable. U equals you. That's why we need access to these services. If people know their status, we can get them in care, and then they're not continuing to transmit the virus. That's what I need people to know. They're no different than you and me. There's no, there's no change in a person outside when they have HIV. They're humans. And this is about human decency. Let's take care of folks. You and I talk about a lot of things, but this is one we don't talk about as much, and that is that there is an easy way to reduce gun deaths in this country, and part of it would be to get guns out of the hands of people with restraining orders because they have been um, uh, involved in or alleged to have been involved in domestic abuse. Absolutely. Amy Klobuchar and I have been working on this for a number of years, and the fact of the matter is, is that we do know that if someone has been accused and convicted of violence against someone with the use of guns, they're likely to do it again. And exactly what this court ruled yesterday is what we are trying to prevent. I, I am I am someone who is hidden in that closet. I'm someone that knows the fear of dying. And the fact that this court would go back 200 years, our forefathers could never believe the danger that women and children and even some men are living in today. It's outrageous, and we are going to go right back at it. Well, we saw what this court did with uh, Roe v. Wade, so it shouldn't surprise people that they take a, uh, this sort of view about guns. But what do we do about this? This is a, a federal court. We've got the Supreme They're relying on a... On a uh, a decision by the Supreme Court, which becomes a little hard to interpret, that, that all gun laws must be consistent with the history of gun laws in this country. And, and, and laws have to bear in mind the relationship that laws had to guns when this country was founded. These are unusual ways to think about these things, but we think, seem to be stuck in this vortex in, in which we are, have courts now protecting the rights of domestic abusers who have a statistically higher likelihood of murdering their, their domestic partners. I mean, what you're saying is what's in the 1994 Violence Against Women Act, we put in a protection against women so that if a, someone had been accused of violence against them, had that protection order, they would be protected. And now this, this court is saying we're not going to protect women and children. We're going to not only reintroduce the legislation, but I hope this does get the Justice Department has said they will appeal it to the Supreme Court. And we need to do a lot of work to show people how the world has changed. And our four fathers, should have been some mothers there, could not have, what you just said, those are muscles. They wouldn't be the kind of weapons that we've got today. They can be used because women and children 
it, it's just frightening. People do not understand what domestic abuse is occurring in this country and how the presence of the gun increases the likelihood of real violence and death.